Hi, everyone. I'm Carl Alston from the Leukemia Research Foundation, and welcome to our Blood Cancer Awareness Month live stream with Linda Rivard, who is the nurse coordinator, survivorship in the post clinic pediatric hematology oncology at Advocate Children's Hospital. We're also speaking with Dee Dee Fisher, who is hospital school coordinator, uh, child life, creative arts therapies, and education, also at Advocate Children's Hospital. Good evening, ladies, and thank you so much for doing this. Thank you for having us. Yep, thank you. Absolutely. Oh, thank you. Hey, um, uh, Linda, I'm wondering if you can provide a little bit more background on yourself for uh, so people can understand who we're speaking with tonight. Sure, sure. So I happen to be a mother of a childhood cancer survivor. My son was diagnosed at age five with leukemia, and unfortunately, it relapsed, and he had a bone marrow transplant at age eight. Um, he went on to develop some complications and had a kidney transplant in college and then developed a secondary brain tumor a year and a half ago. Um, but despite all that, he's doing well and healthy. And in the meantime, I was fortunate enough to be able to be part of a um, survivorship clinic. And now I'm the nurse coordinator and I'm an advocate for our patients that despite what the road they've traveled, they do require special monitoring and um, keep them healthy. So, all right. Well, thank you so much for doing this. I really appreciate it and glad that he is doing well. And Didi, if you could do the same thing, please give us a little bit of uh, background on yourself. Sure. So I um, have a bachelor's in um, teaching and education with a master's in um, educational leadership. I've been a teacher for a total of 23 years, which I kind of hate to mm -hmm. say, but um, and I've been in this current role at the hospital um, for almost 14 or 15 years now. Um, and basically my role is um, acting like a liaison for our patients and families, um, connecting them with school and just making sure that um, appropriate accommodations and supports are in place for them um, upon their return to school. Cool, so thank you all. Thank you as well for participating. And I guess I should say that we did have one more person who was going to join us this evening. That was uh, Julia Stepensky uh, with Advocate. Unfortunately, she had some issues with uh, kids and school which is kind of what we're gonna be talking about this evening. So uh, Julia had to participate in school activities with her child, so she couldn't be part of this tonight. So we miss you, Julia, and hopefully you will watch some of this video later. And uh, don't laugh at your coworkers because they're on live streaming on <laughs> Facebook and YouTube. <laughs> we know Julia will too, absolutely. <laughs> All right, so this evening, we're gonna be talking about caregivers and the whole COVID-19 situation. And I'm not talking, I'm talking caregivers uh, as in people who are taking care of their immunocompromised children as they you know, go back to school to some degree in person. And I'm also talking about those same people who may be uh, immunocompromised themselves, but they're sending their kids to school and then those kids are coming home and they may be worried about contracting COVID-19 at some point during the semester or quarter or, you know, first week of school, second week of school, that kind of thing. So we're going to be talking uh, all about that. And uh, we know that the science is changing every second. We know that schools and school districts are trying to deal with that change, you know, as quickly and as efficiently as they can while still teaching children. I can't imagine that being difficult. <laughs> so, uh, oh, one thing I do want to say, if people have questions, all you have to do is put your question in the comment box on Facebook or on YouTube, and that question will get to me and I will ask um, our guests to answer those questions. So um, let's start with the first question. 
what kinds of uh, considerations have you seen families grappling with when it comes to school and dealing with a blood cancer diagnosis? Well, I mean, I guess I'll start out on the medical end. They worry about if their children or survivors, um, are they gonna be worse off or higher at risk at, get, at getting COVID? And the literature is still, and evidence is still emerging. So we really don't know. So I think that's the, their biggest concern is, is they we don't know. Um, that being said, um, a lot of our families that have gone through treatment and are now survivors, at least, they feel like they've been here, done that before, meaning they've been isolated themselves. So kind of going through treatment has been a practice run with COVID, you know, watching going out in public, washing your hands, social distancing, um, keeping yourself away from sick people. So on that end, some of our families have been prepared for this. Um, but school brings another issue that I'll, I'll hand off to Dee Dee, and I don't think there's a magic answer. And the biggest piece of advice I think I can give to families, is, and, and I talk about this with my mom and even my son, because my son, being a kidney transplant survivor, he's chronically immune suppressed. I cannot control a lot around me, right? But all I can control is my inner circle. So those who aren't following the rules, um, I, I can't do anything about that, but we can help control our little piece of the pie, if that makes sense. And sometimes right. it's hard because it does require you to be even more socially isolated than you already are. Mm -hmm. um, and then I'll hand off to Dee Dee with school. Yeah, and I think and I Carl, with um, what a lot of parents are grappling with is just the fact that, you know, whether their kids are... Um, attending school like a hybrid model where maybe some days they can go in person or some days they can be remote. Some schools I know are actually still full in person, um, but parents and caregivers, their biggest fear is for um, you know their children having um, immunosuppression and things like that. And I guess what's key here to just reiterate to parents and caregivers is that it's okay to keep your kids home and full remote. Um, I feel like, you know, um, there is no one answer to all of this. It's, there's still a lot of unknowns and I think it's okay to be, um, take uh, the safe, you know, um, road rather than um, take chances. And schools have been very open to listening to parents' concerns about that and um, giving them that choice to choose um, remote learning versus a hybrid model or in person. Cool, yeah, I, uh, you know, there are some students who have, you know, been in for a couple of weeks already, and then some people, I guess in Chicago, just started, you know, yesterday, today's just Wednesday. Uh, so, and it's the, uh, you know, first Wednesday after uh, Labor Day. So anyway, people are getting started I'm wondering, uh, you know, you guys were both at work today. What kinds of uh, what kinds of calls or kinds of concerns have you gotten just in the last day or so from uh, parents who are worried about this kind of thing? I could speak at least on my end. Most of our my calls have come throughout August when the decision had to be made by parents. Do they pick e-learning? Do they pick the hybrid method? Do they you know, making those decisions. And by default, the decisions made themselves um, that most of the schools did go to 100% e-learning. I think the biggest piece of advice that Dee Dee and I hand out is our parents are worried that if they do choose maybe to go to a hybrid method or go into class, school's very adamant you can't go back and forth. And with our population, whether your child is a, a patient or a parent, know that you can change your mind. Um, you just may need a note from your um, your healthcare team. So just be aware of that and don't be afraid to make changes and ask for them. Um, the rules are in place for 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 those to not abuse it, but in, in our family situation, 
um, they can change it and they can, you know, they can get a medical necessity letter from their provider. Oh yeah. I mean, that would be good because, uh, you know, just, just as the science is changing, yeah. um, and schools are asking parents to be flexible, you know, I'm guessing pa parents need to be, you know, ask for what they need, you know, especially when you have a child who's immunocompromised or on the other side, if you're immunocompromised and you're worried about your child, you know, becoming ill and then coming home and making you ill. So are there any, uh, are there any programs or things that you know of, uh, Didi, that people have already employed to kind of make the uh, back to school thing easier? Um. You know, there's a lot out there. I know it can be very overwhelming for parents to um, research different programs. I'm not sure, Carl, can you just explain a little bit more as to what you mean by programs, though? Something well, to help with e-learning or? Yeah, uh, I think um, maybe not just something to help with e-learning, but I'm thinking about, you know, a little bit about what Linda just said. If you are having difficulties or if you're anticipating difficulties, I guess, are there programs in place that the schools can employ if you just ask, you know, kind of like, all right, I made a mistake. It's a, it, we're a weekend, my child is already sick or whatever. Can I switch to remote learning? Can I switch to a hybrid thing or whatever? Because I know the districts are saying not necessarily or just outright no, but like Linda said, there are ways to you know, get what you need. Right. And with an underlying medical um, history, that is just like Linda said, you reach out to your um, oncology providers and um, that medical team will work with you and your child to, um, you know, create some type of documentation that is needed in order for school to support your child, whether it's, you know, full remote or hybrid or, um, you know, in person. But that's my suggestion, just to reach out to your medical team. Um, most hospitals, uh, you know, their oncology programs, whether it be um, the social worker or um, a nurse practitioner or the physician themselves or someone like me, uh, a school coordinator that works with the families, um, mm -hmm. I think just bringing it up you know, and finding out what documentation is needed from school first. And I'm sure the providers and the medical team would be happy to help with that. All right. All right. Um, I'm going to, Carl, speak up and, and I'm just going to just briefly mention it, but let Dee Dee take it, is that let families know that their IEP 504 accommodations can still be in place with remote learning. And if patients or family members are struggling, they could reach out for social work, psychosocial services through the school, even remotely. And Didi, I'll let you expand on that because that's your expertise. Yeah, and yeah. I, I hope that most of our school age um, oncology patients have something in place at school through a 504 plan or an IEP. And um, like Linda said, there are um, accommodations put into place specifically to meet their needs to make sure they're successful in school. And one of those is, um, you know, extra time or maybe attendance. You know, a lot is going on with technology issues with these kids getting on to their classes. Um, so again, having certain supports in place will help protect them and keep them successful in school. Okay. I'm wondering if there are, uh, are there <laughs> techniques that parents uh, have already thought of that they're telling their kids to do to keep me safe because I'm the immunocompromised one or are there, and, are there techniques that parents are using for their immunocompromised children to keep them safe as we get into school? I think immunocompromised or not, I, I think um, uh, we've all been educated pretty well on what proper you know, precautions we should be taking 
whether we're in the grocery store, entering school, entering a hospital, whatever it may be. And I think it's just important for parents to sit down with their kids and make sure that, you know, they're all on the same page with, you know, wearing a mask, making sure you're monitoring your temperature, um, washing your hands frequently, things like that. Any other yeah, things, Linda, that you can think of? No, and I, like I said, whether it's a parent going through treatment or a child, it's it's the same kind of precautions that they should put in place when they're going undergoing therapy. Um, the difference is we're relying on other people to be a little bit more cautious too. And and, and that that I wish I had a magic answer <laughs> on on what's outside your little inner circle, but I, I don't. And um, I think that's what causes probably a little bit of the anxiety and turmoil of going back to school is knowing you don't, there's a lot that you don't have control over. Um, and then trying to make the best educated decision for this part of your life, knowing that eventually we will move on, right? We just don't know. Um, and, and I think the biggest thing would be, um, that is not my expertise. I know it's not Dee Dee's, but um, you know, I reached out to our psychologist and a couple of resources, and I know I gave them to you, um, Carl. So to know that, please, after um, after this um, this Facebook forum, to please look at the resources that we gave you to reach out for for mental health. Um, you know. And don't be afraid to reach out for mental health um, assistance right, right. by no means. I mean, I think everybody's on the same page of um, this is overwhelming and everybody has their different concerns. And, you know, we're all feeling it different in different ways. And 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 no, we're not alone. I mean, Didi and I talk about that. But please, please, you know, feel free to reach out, whether you're a parent going through treatment that want to help your child deal with you know, them being afraid to go to school because of mom and dad or the parent, you know, letting you being worried about letting their, their child go back to school. So there's resources out there. And like I said, our psychologist gave us a great resource to definitely explore and utilize the school social worker, too. Um, I mean, they may be overwhelmed right now, um, but at least it's a good it's a good start. And, yeah, and your, yeah. your treatment center is another wonderful, I think sometimes we're, we're so good at all these different resources, but sometimes our own treatment summary is wonderful. We just have to let them know, um, you know, the patients have to let them know what they need. Um, sometimes right, right. being on the other end, you know, we, we can't read minds or I know it gets busy in clinic and you forget to bring up some of those things. So feel free to email um you know leave messages if you think it's something in the middle of the night you know leave a message on somebody's phone um right i'm glad that you brought that up because uh you know i was going to ask about the uh you know the mental wellness part of the equation too because you know physically you can be doing everything that you know everything that we know of at this point to stay safe but yeah it's got to be taking a toll both in you know, just being at home, not being in school, not being with your friends, being worried if, you know, you're a parent who is immunocompromised. So I'm glad that you brought up those uh, resources that we are going to put on the Leukemia Research Foundation website um, sometime tomorrow so that everybody can have access to them. And I'm hoping that everybody is about to see a link on their screen uh, that says, you can go to allbloodcancers.org slash resources to find those new resources that we're putting up. That page already exists and has a lot of resources on it, but we are gonna add the ones that uh, you provided earlier today so that people will have access to them and can um, you know, do what they need to do as far as asking questions or getting additional support. So uh, thank you for those and me bring everybody back up so I can see what's going on. So have you had um, patients so far who have come in uh, with, you know, issues that were more of the mental health variety uh, as opposed to the physical? 
you know, when COVID, it, it, on my end, when COVID, you know, back in April, March, April, um, feel, we fielded a lot of emails because there were a lot of unknowns, right? And we don't have, we still don't have a lot of answers and we still, still don't, um, there's still a lot we don't know. Obviously, you're undergoing treatment and you're immunocompromised. It's it's a little bit more clear cut on on the guidelines and protect yourself and what have you. And and the problem is once patients go off therapy, and then we assume their immune system is recovering. That that's a lot of gray area. Um, so as far as mental health, what we've done is a lot of letters, writing to schools or to work, just to um, we can't commit one way or the other that they should not work, should work, should work remotely, but at least we document their prior diagnosis and the treatment they received and whether is that treatment hard on the lungs, the heart, what, whatever it may be that may um, raise red flags that an employer may want to look at, hey, how could we accommodate um, a family member, if that makes sense, or a patient? Sure, sure. Um, I just want to say one more time that if people who are watching now, if you have questions, just put your questions in the comment section in uh, on Facebook or YouTube, and I will see that now be able to ask uh, the ladies on your behalf. So um, let's see uh, any last uh, you know kind of tips for families as we get going here because everybody, you know, whether they've been in for two weeks or this is the second day. You know, you're in the beginning and, uh, you know, things are going to come up in this first quarter and this first semester. Uh, any tips from either of you regarding, uh, you know, what people can do to help themselves, either physically, mentally or administratively in dealing with the schools? I think, um, Linda, I'll go first. I, I think just taking time for yourself. Um, you know, whether you're worried about yourself or your family, your children, um, you know, taking time out of your day every day to have um, self-care. And as far as schools are concerned, I, I hope that parents and caregivers um, can be more patient. Um, you know, in these first couple weeks, it's very new to everybody. We're all on uncharted ground here. And Nobody's ever experienced this. Schools are trying their hardest to, um, you know, work out kinks in technology and just e-learning in itself. So um, I guess my best advice would be just for, you know, parents and caregivers to just be patient and um, please voice your concerns to your teachers, um, you know, or any frustrations or um you know, different roadblocks that you're having with the e-learning um, or with, you know, your child is having with e-learning, the teachers need to know. That's why they're there. They're trying to work out everything um, that they possibly can to make it smoother for all of the kids. So I, I think that's my best advice is just to keep collaborating with school and, um, you know, keep uh, keep being patient. <laughs> We're all in this together. Um, there's not one person that has not been affected by all of this. And um, it's just, it's tough all around, but we're in it together. Cool, Linda? My biggest thing is probably gonna go to the caretakers, the caregivers. Um, here at Advocate, we have a safe care promise that we are putting everything in place to promise that when you come to any advocate facility that we've put everything in place to protect you from this virus or infectious disease. And I know for a fact every other healthcare facility is doing the same. So regardless of where you're going, please do not neglect your health. If you're due for a mammogram, please take care of that. If you're doing if you're due for a colonoscopy, if you're due for a checkup, if you have symptoms of anything, chest pain, anything like that, please take care of yourself and don't be afraid to visit a healthcare facility to take care of yourself. Because that's some of the things that I do worry about 
you know, a year or two from now that maybe there's a cancer diagnosis that's gotten out of hand that maybe we, you know, if that family member or caregiver could have taken care of it now would have been better control. Um, the symptoms of chest pain that were ignored because they were afraid to go in and take care of now is become a big card, a bigger cardiac issue than if it was addressed earlier. So I think, you know, we know we're taking care of our patients, whether it's our child or a parent, um, but the caregivers also have to take care of themselves. And I, I, and I, I, the healthcare facilities are safe. And I, I could speak for myself with advocate, you know, the, the um, be safe promise is there. And I've gotten positive feedback um, that they love how it's run now. It's, it's, and I don't think healthcare is gonna go back to how we were before with the overcrowded waiting rooms, the, the um, you know, the two hour waits in the doctor's office filled with, you know, millions of people. Um, we've, we've, we've learned a lot from that. So I, I think that's the biggest piece, especially since this is about caregivers is please take care of your own health because you don't want that survivor, that person you're caring for to, to outlive you because you, you neglected your own health. Oh, I am so glad that you mentioned that because I know, you know, back in the day, eons ago, which really means like four months, that people were afraid to continue with their, you know, maintenance therapy, for example, or go in for some of those, you know, sort of regular uh, uh, appointments that they would have. And, you know, I guess some places were actually saying, well, don't quite come in yet. We don't know what's going on. But you know, that time has gone by and things have changed. So hospitals are now safer to go into. So you should go and take care of those things that you might have been pushing off to the side a little bit to see what was going to happen with COVID-19 because, you know, COVID, I guess, will resurge, you know, or is resurging in various places or whatever. But as long as people know that they can get to the doctor and be safe and take care of themselves, then that's going to be good no matter what part of the equation you're in. So. And two, right. um, just a real quick, you know, telehealth is like just kind of blossomed. And, you know, if you have, if, if, whether it's a patient, whether it's a caregiver, if they have symptoms and they're nervous about going in, request a telehealth visit. Um, you know, it's something you could discuss virtually and then it's up to the provider to, to decide, hey, is it something you need to come into the office for? Or maybe we could do labs and imaging before we bring you in. So there's always a way around that too. So um, just don't know that your first step into taking care of yourself, whether on the patient end or um, the caregiver necessarily has to be an in-person visit. Okay. okay. All right, well, thanks for that information. And uh, I'm not seeing any questions. So if there are none, I will go ahead and thank you both, Linda and Didi, for participating in this and, you know, helping us out with really great information. Linda, or I'm sorry, not Linda, but Julia, I wish you could have been with us, but uh, we're thinking about you and hope everything is going well with you. Uh, I wanted Linda to be on because she's a two-time lymphoma survivor, and I know that she would have had some uh, perspective of, uh, of this, both being a medical professional and being a person living with a, uh, you know, living with a blood cancer. Uh, Linda, of course, has a son who has dealt with uh, uh, blood cancer and other cancers, I guess, in the, you know, during this time. So we really appreciate your perspectives. And uh, I want to let everybody know that, uh, you know, September is Blood Cancer Awareness Month. This will not be the only stream that we do. We've got a couple more streams during which time we'll be talking with researchers and uh, in just a couple of days, we will be speaking with a uh, young blood cancer uh, patient survivor, uh, getting to know her and her story and what things she's been thinking about as a, a younger adult living with a blood cancer. So that's coming up. Uh, we also have a patient program that's going to be starting in about a week um, on the on Wednesday, September sixteenth. The first one happens. These will all be from 7.30 to 9 p.m. Uh, this uh, On Wednesday, 16th, we're gonna be covering CLL and small lymphocytic lymphoma. 
Then two weeks later, which is September 30th, we're going to be talking about aggressive non-Hodgkin's lymphoma and CAR T-cell therapy and other immunotherapies. And then two weeks after that, which would be October 14th, we're going to be talking about myelodysplastic syndromes and acute myeloid leukemia. So please go to the uh, Leukemia Research Foundation website, allbloodcancers.org. And if you click on virtual series link at the top of the page, you'll get to the page. It gives you all the information on all the topics that we're going to be covering uh, for that six week period. And you'll be able to register there. Uh, if you choose to uh, participate and help us with Blood Cancer Awareness Month, just click on the Blood Cancer Awareness Month link and you will find a toolkit there with things that you can do to help us spread the word about blood cancers and the important work that we're doing. And if there is any possibility at all, please donate to the Leukemia Research Foundation so we can keep doing things like these patient education programs and we can keep funding research so we can finally find a cure for blood cancers and put ourselves out of business. Um, I did want to uh, let you guys know that Bree has said, great job, ladies, and thank you for the excellent information. So just wanted to let you know that you were appreciated, all right? <laughs> okay, thanks. Thank you so much again. And thank you, everybody, for tuning in. Again, I'm Carl Austin with the Leukemia Research Foundation, and we will see you next time. Thank, thank you, Carl.